think it's because of what art can often do or a story can do where you feel seen and you feel you feel like you're not alone and um and i do find that from an emotional point of of view it's very very important for an artist you know people go why do you do this to yourself or why do you you know why do you do what you want to do like the violinist going I just do what I'm doing and I'm loving it yeah you know at some point there'll be someone out there that will be able to identify because if you're doing it from a place of either just wanting just being a joy seeker or trying to make sense of a topic or trying to you know and you let it out and you release it People can either feel kind of alienated by it or there'll be certain people that will feel, but at least they'll be feeling. Good morning, Emma. It's so great to meet you here on Zoom. Morning, Pietra. It's so, so cool to finally meet you. <laughs> I'm so happy that we finally get to chat. I mean, we've been trying to set up a Zoom call for a while now. I know, I know, <laughs> no, it's, it's, but it, you know, I always believe it happens at the right time. So that's good. But it's so lovely where you are. And where are you based exactly? So I'm based in Cape Town at the moment. I'm in Johannesburg working on a project. Um, it's my day off today. Um, so I'm now at, in a new co- accommodation space. And yeah. it's lovely. It's such a beautiful little um, garden that I'm sitting in. And it's like this porch. Oh, wow. It's so lovely. Oh, yeah. so I'm still getting used to it. I only got here about an hour ago. but Oh, um, Okay. So yeah. it's so, soaking up the good weather. Yes, it's so lovely. But yeah, I do. I really do enjoy Johannesburg. I must say, when I come here, it feels like I'm ready to work and the people are so lovely. So um, yeah, it feels... That's great. So, but where, where are you from originally? So where were you born? I was born in Melville, Johannesburg. Mm-hmm. and um, then moved to Cape Town when I was about six years old. And then I grew up in Somerset West and I've been staying and working in Cape Town since. So, yeah. Oh, wonderful. So it's nice to be back. Yeah. Nice to be back in Joburg. <laughs> yeah, I would say where the roots are. And, yeah. yeah. Really so, Emma, um, where did you start? Where Where did the interest in in acting because you you are a multi-talented um you're an actress you are a musician songwriter and also a producer so where did this love for acting start wow um it actually started at school it it was an interesting one for me um acting has always been i don't know i spoke the other day to a friend about the idea of when you are called to do something and when something is your calling. I don't know. We kind of just opened this up as a food for thought. And I would say, you know, when kind of, you know, you go through life and you have something that you are so incredibly passionate about, it's your make or break. Um, I would say the calling has often been music for me, but I feel like I've been called to act. And when I say that, so the difference between calling and being called to is there's an ease about the process of acting for me. Um, It's always been kind of a space for me where whenever I feel like I'm about to be completely burnt out or um, I want to just reconnect with people, I kind of find myself in a space where I am then in a production or busy acting and I'm so it's so easy and wonderful and enjoyable for me that I don't attach my heart, soul, blood, sweat, and tears to the art, uh, to this art form. I almost feel like that kind of lies more with the music side of things. Um, But when it comes to acting, the love for it actually really, it lies in this, I wouldn't say it's escapism, but more like a rejuvenation that I experience. And Every time I found myself kind of on the verge of burning out or over exuding myself and then I'm in a production, I feel like I go into this little bubble and 
I felt, I almost feel like I'm being called to be there to find rejuvenation, to kind of fill up my, my empty tank. And, um, and then at the same time to tell a story and, um, yeah, that's kind of where it started was at school and mm. if it's, yeah, but just... you, you're saying that now it reminds me of and I can't remember the author's name of the book that I uh, read but it's like when you find your flow when you find when you get into that flow where it just happens you know there's no effort really involved it just the one thing leads to another and it just happens for you and maybe that's the thing that you're talking about now that it's just you you are in your flow when you act Yes, yes, a hundred percent. It's such but, an interesting thing to experience something like that. Mm. But you say it at school. So did you at school were you interested in in acting then as well and music and and uh, uh, sp specific art forms? Yes. So it started off with music. Um, you know, I I did my first debut performance when I was seven at this amphitheater in Cape Town. And um, I sang Annie. <laughs> um, I oh, wasn't, wow. Yeah, oh, but it was, I love that musical. Yes, exactly. So it was quite, um, it was quite an experience to be on stage and to perform and just ha have this kind of fearlessness of, you know, there's no turning back, you have to do it. Um, so I carried on with music. I mean, music's always been, let's say, the starting point for me on the creative side. But when ac acting was kind of triggered, when I realized I wasn't very good at science at school, it was one of my... Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm with you there. <laughs> So I just realized this is not working. And my parents said, well, why don't you just study drama, you know, as another. So I did music and then drama was one of my other subjects. And um, I thought, yeah, well, I mean, that makes complete sense. You know, then I can kind of marry the two, you know, on stage performance, off stage creativity, just all sorts of things like that. And um, I must say, I it it was an interesting because it was almost like a battle between the two for quite a long time music or drama drama or music um where my almost love for drama would go like this and then music would do that and then it would constantly have this kind of ebb and flow um and then I would say when I was done with school I had to choose between whether I was going to do music or drama and it was a no-brainer for me. I was like, I'm going to do music. I've been studying classical, you know, my whole life. This is what I'm going to do. But my audition to be it, to be part of the um, music department and to study music went so badly. I it was know. a disaster. I don't know what happened, but it was like everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. And I in that time also had done my grade eight piano exam and something happened to me where I realized that I was sitting in this room doing my, my exam with one other person that had flown down from Europe that was now going to indicate whether I pass, you know, this exam, this exam or not. And it was Mozart and Bach and that kind of thing that I that I performed but there was a part of me that almost rebelled against it where I thought but how do we know how Bach would have wanted us to perform this how do we truly know how Mozart would have wanted us to perform this I think that yes the accent placements are there but maybe there's something more performative to it maybe there's something you know so I was questioning at my 17 18 year old stage of life you know kind of really feeling quite worked up about you know the concept of that and then I realized that drama was going to help me explore that and I went and studied theater and I, at the same time, worked on music um, at my own capacity for, you know, as a creative venture. And I really feel that that marrying of the two um, really helped me kind of find a connection with the audience and find a connection with, you know, how to tell a story and portray it is that, you know, physically to be able to have the confidence of presenting it mixed with um, kind of the precision of 
creativity sometimes and the perfectionism and kind of just trying to find a way to navigate and balance the two they started you know over time turning almost into one art form for me um, as a whole starry starry night paint your palette blue and gray look out on a summer's day with eyes and all the darkness in my soul Shadows on the hills Sketch the trees and daffodils Catch the breeze and winter chills In the colors of a snowy linen land Now I understand Well, you know what? I have to smile here because uh, when I said in the beginning the timing of all the interviews are always so spot on. I just spoke to Branimir, um, I can't get his surname now, but he's a singer, actor, and he talks exactly about this thing where you explore yourself, you know, where you get out of that box and you just do your own thing and you, you explore the art form. And then also a few, um, I think it was in last week that I spoke to to Dolly Henry, and she's a jazz dancer, and she talks exactly about that, getting out, getting out of the box, finding yourself, you know, putting yourself on on in this um, art form or or expressing yourself in that way. And it's so wonderful that you're talking exactly about the same thing. And I can hear these stories; they they have the same type of flow, you know, that that uh, going that way. And it's wonderful. That's amazing. Yeah, um, yeah it's I, incredible. I, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing that we yeah. kind of share the same sentiments in a sense and thinking exactly. about the same things. Yeah. It, it sort of reinforces the same thing. And I think it's so important that people hear that because like you say, you know, you had your mindset on music and I think, a lot of young people do that, you know, they, oh, this is what I want to go. This is my, my, the route that I want to take. And then sometimes there's something that stops you from doing that. And that's not the end of the world. That's, that uh, stop is sometimes just a way of going in another direction that will take you back again, but in a different way, you know? Yes. One shouldn't actually be afraid of, the resistance that happens yeah um, definitely I, I've also noticed you know throughout the years I think especially when when you let's say you know there's there's often let's say a fear with creatives and I've also found it specifically in the music industry with females you know they think that they have a very short lifespan because you know when you think of pop stars or that kind of thing you know yeah. they longevity is very much you know they need to still look very cute and attractive and you know it's a whole package kind of thing and then you go I'm running out of time I'd not wear this artist yeah. at this age or you know that kind of thing but then if you just keep exploring and actually just caring about what you are doing on the daily instead of thinking there thinking yeah I love it I I'm going to I'm going to link um um this other interview, um, Branimir, I'm going to link this in your interview because, and in, in the description, because, I mean, this is absolutely, I wish you could meet this guy because it's absolutely the same story. It's, it's the same things you're talking about. It's incredible. But it's true. It's true. Absolutely what you're saying. You know, this rush, this rush to be suddenly, uh, I think, I think this is this, I've thought about it a lot, the urgency of young people to achieve suddenly this huge thing and they 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 don't enjoy the journey and the path towards it. Yeah, Joe, you know, I actually have a very interesting story and this is a psychosomatic thing that almost killed me. This is what's so mm -hmm. wild, like how your mind can really affect your body. Now, there's many factors that added to this, but... When I was about, I had just finished studying and I was just thinking, I'm running out of time. I'm running out of time. I need to do more. I need to do more. I'm working. I was just working on so many things because the ambition was just kind of, it became an obsession. And 
I only slept about two to three hours, like a good hour, a good night's rest was about four hours of sleep. And especially in that time, you know, the hustle culture was seen as good, seen yeah. as productive. It's, you know, you, you're achieving. So it was always kind of part of the identity. And it kind of, I would say almost, I, I thought it gave me edge on the one hand, you know, it's all those kind of things attached to it. But what happened was that there was a lack of surrendering. And that lack of surrendering kind of, I, th- I feel like it pushes away momentum more than anything else. It kind of, yeah. you, know, you just can't, you're building stuff, but there's a lot of heaviness added to every single endeavor you do. And I started getting very, very ill, but it was a slow, slow, slow thing where I just realized, you know, my, my skin is, is doing funny things and I'm really low in energy. And I thought, oh, maybe I'm just a bit burnt out. But it started becoming more serious. I was struggling to see when there was light. Um, I was losing an extreme amount of weight. I was, it was, there was just a lot of things that were going on. And, and then I was tested for a lot of, um, a lot of illnesses or possible things for, for a diagnosis. And the doctor basically did a test on my skin because I had little, I had breakouts and all sorts of things. And she said to me, I mean, then this was at age 21, 22, that um, my skin had completely lost the elasticity. And it was basically of that of a woman in her late fifties. And I was, I kept having the, the same thing run through my mind over and over again of you're too old. You're getting old. You're running out of time. You're getting oh, old. I get goosebumps now. Yeah. Hey? constantly saying I'm getting old I'm getting old and I was so ill that I was put on drips I was I was just not I was just not functioning and I was not like basically my body had kind of stripped itself of the right nourishment even though I was eating well it was just the mind was taking over and I kept just saying I'm running out of time and it was so strange I watched a documentary it was Quincy Jones's documentary just called Quincy and he just does what he does. So it was just one project after the next. He's a hard worker, but he didn't, there's no kind of, oh, by the time you, this age, there's, this momentum stops. And, and I mean, the naivety of that mindset, when you think back on that, but I was in it. And when I watched Quincy and seeing how much he achieved by just buckling down and doing what he's doing every day, um, the sheer vast of, of body of work he's done. And I mean, he's in his eighties now, I believe. Um, and he's still busy and doing his thing. And, and it's just incredible what he's done for artists and all that stuff. It completely shifted my mindset. I started picking up weights again. It was almost like a Benjamin Button moment started happening where everything just kind of acclimatized, went back to normal. And then that natural kind of, without feeling like you're being overambitious, but just doing the things, how much flow there is and how much more abundance there was. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so the mindset is a big, big thing. like that because I also I mean I have uh, children that's also in that in the their 20s and and I also understand that the pressure from social media also or from the media is this hustle culture you know this you have to and it has to and you have to achieve this by then and it does drain you because you're constantly thinking you have to do something So, um, but a a wonderful, thank you for sharing that because I think it is so important to realize also that the body um, follows the mind. Yes. 
It really does. And it can, I mean, if, if you're very strong world and you keep believing things, how that does affect you and also the people around you, just everything on such a level, it really does kind of start multiplying um, mm -hmm. on all facets. And um, you, need, you mustn't be so hard on yourself. It's, it's, it's not worth it. <laughs> exactly. And But uh, you said something um, earlier and you said that your parents actually encouraged you to study drama. Now, um, I know also in South Africa, it's the industry is so much different. And I know from musicians and, and also it's not an industry like in America where you are, um, not that I say you guaranteed there, the pressure there is also big, but I know in South Africa, the arts is not the, it's not the thing, you know, it's, yeah. uh, people want academic results and they want to go and study something where they, I don't know, in science or maths or in law or, uh, you know, but uh, yeah. wonderful that your parents encouraged you to do that, to study drama. Yes. I mean, I, it's an interesting one because I think with that also come certain regrets. Um, you know, they go, go and do that. And then they go, oh, wonder if she should have actually just done marketing or, you know, <laughs> the, the, <laughs> it, it does happen. And I mean, especially yeah. when it it is like that. I mean, you can have the biggest icons in South Africa, but the ceiling is only really that high that you can reach. Um, when it comes to finances, the work, you know, what the industry is worth. Yeah. Um, there's only so many people in South Africa with a certain demographic. So if you want to target a certain target audience, I mean, with 12 different languages or 12 different cultures, you're really only boil boiling it down to a very, very small amount of people unless you try to go global from from the space if you're going to let's say you know be an Afrikaans artist or an English alternative artist um your target market is very very small and quite niche let's say in South Africa itself um and then also on the acting side and, and all those things it, it it is definitely something that um actually my father my so my father is in the industry um so I'm an industry baby and oh, okay. he, so he knows. Yeah. He knows. But but also we spoke about like the old industry versus the current one, where social media and all those things come in. Uh, my father is very successful, you know, and was very successful in that time. My grandfather as well. Now, if I try the same tactics now, it doesn't work. It's too traditional. It doesn't read like that. You have to kind of reinvent it and follow the new trends. So that was quite a shock, I would say, to the momentum of it is, you know, talent isn't really going to get you a place or, you know, precision in your, the way that you go about things, or that, that's not going to get you the momentum that maybe you would have gotten in the past potentially um it's you know it's it's just interesting how that you think okay i've grown up in the industry i know how to how to navigate it and i think i'm going to do it even better or i'm going to try and you know create something more innovative but it doesn't work it's you it, it is quite a fine line but at the same time um i there's an identity thing that happens where you know when your parents know this is a creative child or this is a child that is very much just kind of oozes art. Yeah. Uh, it, it it's, it's a soul thing. And when one walks away from that kind of the mental health things that happen or the triggers that come from that, it's, it's quite intense. And to be able to kind of have a level headed mentality of not focusing too much on the ego focusing too much on my identity is I'm only, I'm only doing this and that's it. Or, you know, I'm only I'm pure, going to be a purist in that I've got respect for people that are like that. I think it's amazing, but the, South Africa does often call for more than one thing. And one shouldn't be ashamed to be navigating more than one thing in South Africa, like, or in this realm. Um, because if you only, pure, you know, purely doing one art form it's incredible if you crack it um and you can only make you know you make a living for the rest of your life only doing that one thing but versatility is not a bad thing um 
Exactly. Yeah. It's actually kind of cool. And mm. I would say for young people out there or anyone really, even, even people that have been in the industry forever and they feel like, Oh, I'm kind of thinking of dabbling more in this. Mm. It's nothing to be shame, you know, ashamed of. I think it's actually, in fact, it makes you kind of very rich as a human being to, yeah. to kind of, and, and go with it. And um, maybe you can also uh, tell me, but I, if I many times if I talk to musicians who uh, tap into different genres or people who do like you, who do different things, then they say the one thing actually helps the other. You know, it's sort of it overlaps in, and uh, enriches everything else you're doing. Yes. I mean, I, I read it. I read it quote actually um it was i'm not going to quote it correctly but it was just basically what was written was in the lines of if you focus on your flaws it will most definitely be a distraction and i think we often find ourselves looking at versatility or contrasted aspects of ourselves as a flaw so let's say someone typecasts you in a certain realm, let's say as like the really nice, sweet person, but then you've got this other kind of side to you that's now writing really intense and dark music. Now someone comes up to you and says, I don't really understand, like you, you are confusing to me. Now you place that in your mind and you go, oh my gosh, I'm I, maybe I'm confusing. So now you go, but maybe that's how I am. Well, that's, that's kind of the route I'm taking, or this is, yeah. but actually, I think you can apply that to everyday life as well. Let's say you're a mother and you decide all you need to do right now is just go for a walk. You just need to go for a walk. Now you put your shoes on and then next thing you distract yourself by going, oh wait, no, but actually first I did say that I'm going to do this for my child quickly. And then you quickly go and do that. Then, then you go, okay, but I'm, I, I'm distracting. Not, I am not doing what I'm supposed to do. I need to go for a walk. Then you try and go for a walk. Then you stop yourself again. And you go, oh no, actually now I've been wasting time. I need to actually start cooking. Then you go back yeah. and just hopping from one well, thing. I know to that very well. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Like that with anything. And that's the thing, that versatility or not being scared of it is stepping into a space and going, I've committed now. I might not be the best in, let's say, mixing. I'm not thinking about audio production. Not Maybe not the best mixer. But I've been asked right now to put together a choral group. And I am kind of good with our harmonies. And I don't have to question now, oh, but, you know, I did... Say, had this long conversation yesterday with someone about writing a script and now look at me what am I doing here with a choir I don't know it sounds weird yeah but no I understand completely what you mean yeah you know but yeah. instead of going like this is the choice I'm going with it I'm not going to distract myself I will be able to get to this again or you know I will have and if I can't get to that there's a reason for it we move on exactly. you know mm. So, and then it's that timing thing also that when you go back or when you go to something else, then it's that time is the right time for it. Exactly, exactly. And not to feel bad that you're not getting to it or, you know, that other people are maybe reacting to something because they're holding you accountable for, let's say, a conversation you once had yeah. where they get excited for something. But then you go, but it's okay. It's okay that I don't necessarily have something to show for that conversation I had last week right now but it will eventually happen and the, the the person that will do it is you you as an artist you're a product you know you but you're also a collective and we all do you know we all like moving parts that kind of come together and, exactly. mm -hmm. and it, it either works or it doesn't and it's okay so yeah no that's that's absolutely true and um, it's also wonderful, like you say, that you do all these different things because then it also gives you more opportunity because you you can tap into different things. So if, if the acting is slow, then you have music to focus on and, and I see you also producing. So tell me about that. Yes, so um, I, wow, okay. 
I do, I produce for ad campaigns. Um, I also for, you know, certain launches of, of certain campaigns, that kind of thing. So I've worked with various artists, um, uh, someone like Zulani Mahola, um, I've worked with Tyler Page. I've worked with some, some very wonderful artists where I'm kind of the, the person by the computer, yeah. um, busy creating the stuff and trying to make the vision come to life. Um, but then also within my own capacity, I, I work in audio post-production, you know, in films, um, and then as well as my own ventures, uh, which is, you know, music, my own music and that kind of thing. the seaside he remembers those bright eyes dancing in the moonlight super sweet bliss those forbidden lips he was looking for amanda he met her by the seaside she is known for her white lies taking it in her stride being the fix to men's humble wish take on her love so But I think I thought about it yesterday, you know, with kind of the thing of when certain things are, you know, are slower than others or, you know, there's almost like this filler that happens. Um, it is so amazing because I thought about it the other day where someone asked me, are you busy as an actor? And I was like, I can't actually tell you whether I am or not because there's always something to do every day. So when an acting job comes in, it's like, do I have time for it? Yes. And then we go. But all the other times, you know, one is working on a campaign or juggling a creative venture or trying your own kind of personal hobby or that kind of thing. So I've been feeling very, I would say very excited about this phase of life, kind of not really seeing what is, what is busier than the other or what is, you know, kind of taking the the reins over the other, they kind of, it's kind of every day is just asking for something. And, yeah. it, it you know, you're either finding yourself on a set or next moment finding yourself in a studio. And, um, and I, it's been really lovely. And it started off with me being a very stubborn female um, music maker where I, I felt kind of frustrated that I couldn't, communicate with engineers what I wanted um, in my music and I knew that it wasn't their fault it was the fact that I don't have the jargon so I can't say make it sound like this is underwater and then make it go doof, doof. you know they're not always oh, yeah, gonna, yeah. You know I, what I, mean? oh, I know I know what you mean yeah you know now you're mm. trying to find it so that's when I started studying um, sound production so I studied sound production after um, drama uh, while I was working as a musician in Shanghai and I, I over time basically practiced on my own musical endeavors. When I had a song in my head, I would take a reference and try and build something and, and really taking the time to go towards the standard of what you are hearing in your mind, not to just try and get it finished to try and get it done, but to really go, why does that beat sound like that? How do we sculpt it? And that definitely helped me in the long run to be able to um, kind of understand a broad spectrum of the world of audio um, and to be able to kind of bring that to light for clients or yourself or other artists. Starry, starry night Flaming flowers that brightly blaze Swirling clouds in violet haze Reflect in Vincent eyes of China blue Colors changing hue Morning fields of amber grain Weathered faces lined in pain Are soothed beneath the artist's loving hand Now I understand What you tried to say to me Suffered for your sanity 
Hãy try to set them free They would not listen They did not know how Perhaps they'll listen now But doesn't it also give gives you more control over what you're doing because then you can do it the way you want to do it and not because somebody else doesn't understand uh, you know I think that's wonderful that you did that yes I, I think it started off with you know I was first in a school band you know or a band with school members in yeah. and and we, we we had so much fun and we were so creative um, but there was a part of me that wanted to kind of incorporate more electronic aspects or things like that. But we were quite purist in in kind of more of like an alternative jazz style. And I remember just kind of thinking, you know, this is not the place for me to try these things out. Mm-hmm. If I want to try it out, I can't get angry at my band members. I need to be yeah. able to, you know, it's not their fault. It's, not, it's nobody's fault. It's more just a, a yearning to be able to try try and explore something and maybe this is just not the place to do it so to be able to in, in, enable yourself and not blame others for it or blame circumstances for it but to try and just kind of go okay I'm looking at a computer now I'm not technically technologically very savvy it's gonna probably take me 20 times longer than the person sitting next to me but just sit down and what yeah <laughs> And just try, just try. It's you yeah. will eventually get it right. Mm. Mm. Now I totally agree with you. I mean, um, I take myself. I didn't even know what Zoom was uh, before lockdown, and and I had to also well learn and teach myself to edit and and do all these things. So it just enables you and and to give you the opportunity to do what you want to do. Because if you have something in your mind to have to depend on other people is also sometimes difficult, you know, especially when they don't see what you want. Yes, exactly. It is so empowering to be able to do that. And then also, I guess, also to find that balance between, you know, when you, when you do too much yourself um, and then to yeah. be able to at some point go, oh, I think I might be able to delegate this. Ooh, exactly. Yeah. Passing it on. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. But I also spoke to a, a violinist. Um, and now I, I I forget always the last names, but Mia. I just recently posted it, and Ooh, she so does her absolute own thing, and she explores the violin, she explores the music. And I asked her this. I asked her, do you sometimes um, have that pressure of wondering, is it is it okay? You know, will people like it? And she said. No, she doesn't. She she just loves what she's doing. She gets so excited when she does it, and and she never think of of that, you know, of what people will think or what if people will like it. And and it ends up she has an audience. She has people who love what she's doing, and she's just love what she's doing. So in the end, I think this is so important to find that identity and to find that. What is it that I want to say as an artist and what is it that, that I want to give? And also in that space, what you, uh, it's not just about um, the, the audience, but it's also about you and your growth and, and how, uh, you know, what you experience in the process. Yes. Yeah. It, it, because ultimately, um, it, it, I don't know, this is maybe just a thought that I have, but I sometimes find that creatives, you get some that are extremely eloquent, you know, when it comes to how they feel about something or, but when it comes to those really hard topics where there's this feeling of confusion and you're just trying to make sense of it. um, I, for one, know that I really struggle to stand up for myself, for example or struggle to make sense of something and I feel then you feel so trapped and you you constantly mulling things in your head but the moment you creatively write it down but then the 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 release of it to be able to put it out 
um, that's a whole different thing. That's a whole different step. But that step of releasing it so that people are play witness to it, that's a very healing experience. Um, I found that it's a, it's just a healing experience. I mean, I I once did a one woman show, um, and it was a very vulnerable autobiography. I actually was so scared of of doing this show because it it I kind of created it was like a marketing thing where it was meant to just be like a piano and singing show where I'm telling stories about my time in Shanghai, but the story what happened in that hotel was so fascinating and strange and intense and it was actually not a very enjoyable it, as amazing as it was it was also not very enjoyable in in many ways and I, I because I was alone in this hotel I really had to find ways to try and psychologically make sense of it all so I created a one woman show surrounding it and and, and basically performing it every single time was almost a step closer to just making sense of everything. And then at some point you just go, I don't need to perform it anymore. I'm not sitting with this anger pent up inside me or this hurt or this confusion. Um, and I think that's often what artists do. And, and, and also with audience members, there was a woman that had a panic attack at the end of the, it was quite female focused in a sense of all well, you being as a woman, but there was a woman that had a panic attack. There's another woman that she also, um, she had a heart attack. I'm not saying that that's exactly what, that I, I, no. that all. You caused it, yeah. No, but there was a lot, often little moments where there were women that weren't coping and it wasn't because of the shock factor. I think it's because of what art can often do or a story can do where you feel seen and you feel, you feel like you're not alone. And, um, and I do find that from an emotional point of, of view, it's very, very important for an artist. You know, people go, why do you do this to yourself? Or why do you, you know, why do you do what you want to do? Like the violinist going, I just do what I'm doing and I'm loving it. Yeah. It, you know, at some point there'll be someone out there that will be able to identify because if you're doing it from a place of either just wanting, just being a joy seeker or trying to make sense of a topic or trying to, you know, and you let it out and you release it, people can either feel kind of alienated by it or there'll be certain people that will feel, but at least they'll be feeling. And exactly. I think that creates so much momentum and topics of conversation and forward thinking that um, I th often find like a normal, I would say, run of the mill job is not necessarily going to help create, won't trigger that momentum. Is, long before it begins, make me thrillers only you know how. Sway me smooth, sway me now. So I cry alcohol for giftiging for three days long. And I will see it's alcohol on spiel because you must never show weakness to boss. But it's true, and it, it also comes down to uh, a cellist once said to me that because we were talking about applause, you know, and I said it must be wonderful that to have that applause. And he said, yes, that is wonderful. But for him, what, it, what really um, makes it worth it for him is that one person that comes after the show and just say, hey, thanks, you know, I wasn't, I, I didn't want to go today or I didn't want to come tonight because I, I was so tired from work, but really you you moved something in me with your performance. He said that that one person for him is, is almost more than the a whole audience of people applauding. So, and I think also it comes to that where you say this, this number thing, you know, you uh, when you when you have big audiences, it's not necessarily that you that you the greatest artist. It's sometimes that thing where you have maybe a small audience and you touch a few people. But 
this is what it's meant to be, this is what art is meant to do. That is so spot on. Um, mm. It's and it's so profound. Um, I kind of the the two kind of things that it's making me think of. Um, so when I was performing in Shanghai, I was a residency musician and it was a brand new hotel. So at that point, there were almost never patrons that stayed in that hotel in the first three months, but maybe be one person that living in that hotel. It was so strange and so eerie. Um, and I, you know, I remember sitting and performing and going, you know, what am I even doing? You know, I'm sitting here sometimes even performing to no one in an evening, but I have to sit and play because I'm paid to, and I, I need to. And then they, every now and then be, later on, they came more and more people, you know, throughout the year. Um, but it was so interesting to observe people sitting there with their glass of wine looking out and just let's say seeing them shed a tear in their own world they don't not acknowledge you but there's this weird intimacy that happens where there's a person there that feels safe enough to ponder on something and to be kind of within the atmosphere of the room and they don't leave and that for me was one of the biggest rewards was the fact that they can sit there and and feel very vulnerable and you know be there in this foreign country but to not feel compelled to move or to feel like they need to escape the room but rather sit in it and then they would order another glass or then they'd order some food and they would sit and have this emotional thing and then when they just come up to you and they just go thank you I needed that just that oh wow yeah you know was exactly like you said and what that artist spoke of was you know that that is the biggest gift that you can receive um but the second thing it made me think of was um I once watched an Ed Sheeran concert he was here in South Africa it's a bit of a backstory but I I remembered I had a bit of a traumatic experience with a friend of mine that was, um, you know, we, we decided we we're going to go. And there were these two audience members, very young um, audience members, but they were extremely abusive. It was very scary. Like they tried to burn us with cigarettes and they took out bags and threw it in the, I don't know, they were just, it was just a very messy experience and quite strange. And we ended up leaving earlier because it was just very, very intense. And uh, yeah, it was just, not a good experience and I remembered how upset I was of course you know you one would be upset yeah but what was so strange about the reason for me being upset was not really the fact that those audience members were as abusive as they were it was the fact that I was not able to whip my phone out and show what a good time I was having at an Ed Sheeran concert so that I can post oh. it on social media Oh, I'm, and, yeah. And I'm thinking, I finally made it there. I've seen everyone watch, you know, the run of the Ed Sheeran cars, and my experience wasn't like that. And I should have, I wanted that video, and I can't post it now. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows you were there. Nobody knows. You were, exactly. Except for those two guys or the Not two youngsters. <laughs> people was, you know, come on, don't rob me of my coolness, you know. <laughs> and, and I, I yeah. remember kind of also just thinking as a musician like this. So there was that. And then the other pondering that happened was I thought this is it for a musician to be able to perform to a whole entire stadium filled with people. But how heartbreaking it must be that if you as an artist knows that like your fans are busy abusing each other and hurting each yeah. other, how upsetting yeah. that is. And yeah. he doesn't know. But then I had this thought, and this is how me going all the way out here, but yeah, yeah. It was this like weird theory that popped up in my brain. Mm -hmm. And I called it the tertiary effect. Mm -hmm. So this is very, but I, I love it. <laughs> okay. I love how you think. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I had this moment where I just thought, and I'm like, the primary is you. Mm -hmm. What do you think? The secondary effect is, let's say you and I speaking that kind of effect that you have with the interpersonal moments between people and conversation. The tertiary effect is 
I would now say, I would call it maybe the media bubble. Mm. It's what we throw out there. So the tertiary effect that I wanted to climb into is I wanted to climb into Ed Sheeran's tertiary, which is the, the, the accolade. I want to be able to be part of that. I want to be able to grab hold of that. So I'm, I'm wanting to be part of the hype and all that stuff. But my primary and my secondary is very messed up. But I'm buying into the tertiary of what that artist has created. That's so true. Yeah. Now, that peanut gallery thing, I think that's why for an artist, when you're performing and you have a peanut gallery, people that are just there for the jaw, they're not really there for you. They are there for your tertiary effect that you're creating. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the times they are there for you, but I'm not kind of just thinking about what one gauges with. I realized I wasn't sitting there watching Ed Sheeran because I really want to hear exactly how he plays that guitar note and how he says those words and that specific song that's going to, it was, I'm cool and I want to, I want to be part of, yeah. of the crowd. You are and, so right. Yeah. You know, and now the same thing was, is, you know, you get some people with, let's say, bad press where let's say they do something that is politically so messed up and they throw it, you know, that's now in their tertiary and everyone's fighting, fighting, fighting with it. But you never know, maybe that guy is just busy having a cup of coffee, going for a walk with their dog and having a great conversation with a friend. What your tertiary is is so almost separate. It's it's a choice that you throw out there. Yeah. But people often tend to attach to that. And that's where the social media comes in. And where I often find that, like when we spoke about the hustle culture or the pressures of social media, children often get detached from their secondary and their primary because they're living in what can I place in the tertiary? What can I place in that exactly. yeah. own media bubble, my own facade mm-hmm. that is detached from me so that people can play with that? But then they kind of, they don't have the tools or the understanding that the magic lies in that little nuance of someone coming up to you and saying, thank you. Exactly. Yeah. In person. And, or, yeah. Oh, sorry. I no, no, no. <laughs> and it, it comes back to that smallest viable audience, uh, meaning that uh, it's it's not the 10,000 uh people you know that's important it's that small audience that you know you are connecting with you are able to connect with them um and you know that's that's the the thing because that is more intimate than this whole uh you know this whole thing this this whole bubble that you're talking about yes it is it's it's amazing yeah, I mean, it makes people sometimes uh, also, you know, look at say numbers. So how many followings do you have? Because then it's important what you're doing. And I say no. It's for me. I want people to, who are interested in what I'm doing, not because there's a number, not because of how many other people, but do you are you interested in what I'm doing then you welcome aboard you know you're welcome to talk to me or you're welcome to to be my following but um yeah it's it's uh, it's really interesting I love how you came up with that and it makes me really think about that mm. but it's, that's I, I mean like you also are saying you know be part of be part if you want to be part of it be part of it if not yeah. then not it's also to do with, you know, when you, I spoke, let's say to a filmmaker, you know, I'm working on a, on a, on set at the moment. And he, 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 it's interesting how you have these amazing artists, but they feel inadequate because they're not part of, in the Afrikaans word, which oh, is yeah. the internal, the internal circle, mm-hmm. the inner circle. The, and then I, I was like, yeah, I, I get that, but why is there such thing as an internal circle? Aren't you the the center of yeah. reality? So, because I've also been there where I go, oh, I feel so left out. I feel like I'm just, I don't even know why I'm here. I'm not getting the inside jokes. I'm lame. Mm. therefore I'm not going to be cool enough for this or you know that kind of thing that insecurity but then you go 
but why am I so dependent on climbing into those people's realm when actually you like you say literally I love what you're saying you know you do what you do and people are invited if they want to be part of it if you're not interested or you feel like it's not resonating that's fine then then find your other kind of equilibrium somewhere else exactly I I don't uh, and and I never persuade people to talk to me I ask people if they are willing to talk but there's nobody on this earth that I'm so uh you know eager to talk to I, I've, I've i really feel everybody is on a plane on, on the same level when when i talk to them because i never persuade anybody and i will never persuade anybody um and you know it's uh, i don't think uh, in in that sense i think it's really i th- i love the individual i love individual stories i love stories i love real people and i want to keep it that way and i think this is um this is sometimes get gets lost because everybody wants to do the same thing you know everybody wants to follow somebody who does something that they want to be part of and that's that whole Ed Sheeran phenomenon that you're talking about you know so yes Mm. But Emma, you, um, it's really, it's so wonderful to talk to you. I'm so glad that it it happened in the end. And um, <laughs> as you see, it it had to be. It just had to be. <laughs> we really, had to give yeah. up our makeup days for this. So. <laughs> <laughs> we are on makeup days for this. Yeah. <laughs> it's like straight after this, go and wash it off with the cleanser. <laughs> 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 chill time um, but really so inspiring uh wonderful work that you're doing wonderful um uh spirit that you have and and beautiful soul uh, really uh, uh you are i'm a big fan now <laughs> of what you're doing but um but tell me now what what are the wishes what you're throwing this out? yeah <laughs> come on you have to make a wish uh they, there's quite a few people who made wishes here their wishes came true so so go for it make a wish not that i'll be able to make the wish come true but i'm for some reason wishes come true oh my gosh okay what is the wish oh i need to find this is a big moment. <laughs> See if they come true. No. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> okay, I'm going to make a wish that you come and do something in Vienna. <gasps> yeah, that's my wish now. I feel so, that. Yeah. I I feel I'm that. I'm putting it out there. <laughs> it's planted. <laughs> it's planted. Yeah. I love that. Oh my gosh. Yes, I'd love that. Mm. Well, let's see. Let's work towards that wish. And um, my wish, my wish is that I, I don't lose momentum um, in what I do because of um, self-doubt and insecurities in order to be able to almost be like a safe space for creatives that feel the same. Um, I want to be able to keep moving forward and have people and you know fans and audience members and everyone feel like that they can walk this journey um with so much happiness and joy with me um and that I can also enjoy other people's journeys with like with Mm. momentum I want momentum is is very important for me for a long time I've I would often find myself stuck in extremely dead spaces um, of doom and gloom. And I feel like I just don't ever want that ever again, just to be able to move forward um, with the people that I surround myself with, people that I meet like you, um, and to just not lose momentum in in life, just to have us just do our thing. 
but you know, you 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 sh they, I don't even think you should consider or, or give the fact that uh, self doubt. You you shouldn't have that at all because the fact that you know it's uh, you doing your thing and you are so mature in what you're doing and you're so mature in your outlook on life and. Uh, absolute inspiration, I think, for anybody who listens to you. And I think the fact that you do your own thing and that you are so adamant to do your own thing um, is, it's so brave, you know, it's wonderful that you do that. I, I really always, when I talk to artists who do that, and um, I think that is so brave, you know, I think that takes courage to say, this is how I want to do it. And this is how I'm doing it doesn't matter if everybody is not on board with me, but I'm doing it my way, then, um, yeah, I think it's brave. Hey, look where F F Frank Sinatra ended up and he did it his way. He did it. Yeah, you see. Yeah. He did it his way. <laughs> That should be the quote on uh, the that's, that's right. The yeah, just, yeah. Follow the page. <laughs> but um and there was no social media that time. So yeah, it's it's that's brave. He did it his way. He did it Emma, his way. Do it your way. And you too. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> but it was so great to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Pietro. Thank I'm you from the beautiful Johannesburg that I love so much. Starry night, paint your palette blue and gray. Look out on a summer's day with eyes that know the darkness in my soul. Shadows on the hills, sketch the trees and daffodils, catch the breeze and winter chills. In the colors of a snowy linen land Now I understand What you tried to say to me How you suffered for your sanity You tried to set them free They did not listen They did not know how Perhaps they'll listen now Starry, starry night Flaming flowers that brightly blaze Swirling clouds in violet haze Reflect in Vincent eyes of china blue Colors changing hue Morning fields of amber green Weathered faces lined in pain Are soothed beneath the artist's loving hand Now I understand What you tried to say to me And how you suffered for your sanity How you tried to set them free They would not listen They did not know how Perhaps they'll listen now For they could not love you It's time love is true Starry, starry night Starry, starry night Portraits home 
and broken on the virgin snow Now I think I know What you tried to say to me And how you suffered for your sanity How you tried to set them free They would not listen they're not listening still Perhaps they never will <laughs> 